I'm so grateful you decided to join us in this continuing celebration of Easter on this Tuesday night. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for your many blessings this day, and especially for the privilege of living in this season of Easter and living in the day of the resurrection. That's been our entire lives. So help us to be grateful and help us to touch and transform our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, our lesson from Sunday in this continuing season of Easter, it was the second Sunday of Easter, it was from the book of Acts. It was a New Testament lesson. And this is an intriguing passage for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is the content of the lesson itself, but number two is where the lesson stops at verse 35. It doesn't go on to verse 36, because there's kind of a story that goes with it. And so let me read to you the lesson for today, first of all. Acts chapter 4. Verse 32, now the entire group of those who believed in Jesus were on, uh, one of one heart and soul. No one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon all of them. There was not a needy person amongst them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Oh, here ends the lesson. Such a beautiful lesson. And I, I, I'm saying that somewhat facetious, facetiously. It's like, this is the utopia that we've all dreamed of. And I will confess, there is a group of Christians who point to this lesson to indicate to us Christians that we, therefore, should all be... Oh, I know, I'm hearing that hiss in the background for, background for a lot of you. We should be communists, because the Bible lays out a communist manifesto, a political system that we should be following. It doesn't, <laughs> okay? This is not a justification for a political system called communism, because I'll tell you why. Communism, like many political systems, is a totalistic system. You don't volunteer to be in a communist system. You are told that you're in a communist system, and you don't have any options to get out. You know, the system of the early Christians, it was by choice. All right, so this is a totalistic system. And the most important thing that's wrong with communism, like, by the way, capitalistic systems, the United States of America, too, falls under the same type of criticism here. Jesus Christ is not at the center. Jesus isn't at the center of any contemporary political isms. And I would contend to you, if you try to make a country in which Jesus Christ is the heart and soul and the center of your country, you will destroy that country and you will destroy people. Because whose definition of what should be enforced by what Jesus tells us to do? Should we impose these things upon people? Should we make them all go to church? Should we make them all be baptized and sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, if you can't do that, which you can't, by the way, then it's not a Christian nation and Jesus isn't at the center. Oh, and by the way, if, if you have a so-called Christian nation and if there is more than one law, it's not a Christian nation. Do you know which law I'm talking about? The law of love. That's a pretty lame heart. But that's it. If the only law in the United States of America isn't love, as we've been loved by Jesus, then it's not a Christian nation. We are not a Christian nation. We're a nation of secular laws. And so Jesus Christ is not the center of communism. Jesus Christ isn't at the center of the United States of America. Never has been. Never was. Remember, we've got more than one law. And it's not about love. And oh, by the way, as soon as you try to legislate and enforce love, it ceases to be love. That's why this is not a passage about communism. It is also why it is not a passage that we can use to justify our own political systems. So get political systems out of your mind. Let's talk about what the Christians did do. 
again, they, by choice, decided to share everything that was common out of love for one another. Because Jesus Christ was at the center of their entire system. Almost. I was trying to be cute. Jesus Christ was at the center of all of these things. At their heart, their soul, their mind. Nobody compelled them to do this. They did it because they wanted to. Now, this system, by the way, didn't last very long. If it really is as we are told in the book of Acts. It didn't last very long because Christians scattered throughout the entire world. And... One of the problems with this is that the early Christians actually literally expected Jesus Christ to return within the next six months, one year, five, you know, then five years went by, then ten years went by, and all of a sudden, everybody sold all of their possessions and shared with the poor. Guess what? All the people who sold all their possessions were now poor. There was no money to share that was left. And then you have Paul who comes out and says, you know what, if you don't get off your butt and work, then you shouldn't be eating. See, the Christians were sitting around waiting for Jesus to return, and Jesus didn't return as expected. And so he said, you don't work, you don't eat. Get off your butt, because that's how you have to provide. So like I said, this was good for a very short time where Christians lived in this communal setting, sold everything they had, but then they ran out of money. And they had to get off their butts and go to work. Okay? And they realized, okay, that was great for a time, but Jesus didn't return as he said he was. We've got to get up and work. Oh, no. All right. So this is the lesson. This is why this lesson cannot be used to justify political systems. It's not about that. It's about the love that they have for one another. And it's also a reminder of number one. So let me tell you what it is about. Number one, Jesus Christ is at the center of everything that we do and the decisions that we make. Number two, this is number one. Number two, number two, we should be, as Christians, really concerned about the plight of the poor and making sure that they are fed and taken care of. It should be one of the most important things that we as the church do. That's why we as a church, again, have been collecting food and taking care of feeding folks over the course of these last months during this pandemic. The poor are always the people that get hurt. You know, most middle class people during this pandemic, you know, it was a struggle maybe sometimes, but most of us kept our jobs, our places of or we were able to get some unemployment for a time and pay our bills and then maybe get another job and so we haven't been hurt as badly as the poor the poor always get a double dump on top of them they're hurting right now to begin with and then something like this happens so the poor even have less and so we always need to be concerned about the poor and making sure that their conditions are taken care of. So this is the purpose of this lesson. Jesus Christ is at the center, and therefore, out of the love that they had for one another, they cared for each other and the poor. The end. Don't make this into a political statement, because it's not. Okay? There are no Christian governments in this world. You can't have a Christian government. It's impossible because we always add to it our secular law. The kingdom of heaven only has one law, the law of love. Oh, and by the way, it's enforced by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. There's no police force. There's no guns in the kingdom of heaven. There's no politicians in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus sits on his throne and we just love each other. That is not the image of any government I see going on in this world today, okay? So don't use this as a justification for that. That's not what it is. All right, let's go on because this, this is where it gets really interesting. And we left it off at verse 35, so let me read to you this. It's kind of harsh, harsh. There was a Levite, it means he was a religious leader. 
He grew up in a religious family. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him and brought it, the money and laid it at the feet of his, the apostles. But there was also another man named Ananias. And with the consent of his wife, Sapphira sold a piece of property. So yeah, they were, they were just glad to do it because it was out of love. But listen to this. This is where it turns a little dark. However, he kept back some of the proceeds and bought only a part of land, a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I'm going to ask you right now, is it okay if you've got, I don't know, a $10,000 worth of stocks, you sell it, and you go to the church and you say, look, I'm giving you $5,000. That would be generous. That would be great. However, that's not what he does. He sells this $10,000 piece of land, whatever. He gets the money for it. He lays it at the apostles' feet and says, here, I've sold the land. I'm giving you all of the proceeds. But he held back a portion of it for himself. He lied to make himself look good. Uh, he, so really, he wasn't doing it out of love. He was doing it out of status, peer pressure, whatever the case might be. He wanted to look generous like everybody else. So here, look what I've given you. He had an evil intention that had nothing to do with love. Okay? This is the point. So Peter asked him, <laughs> you can't pull anything over Peter's eyes, let me tell you. Something happened to Peter between his time with Jesus. Now, I think it was called the Holy Spirit. Peter asked him, why has Satan filled your heart? So that you lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land. So, Peter isn't upset that he's lied to him. Peter's upset that you're lying to God. Just be honest about this. Why would you do this? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? Remember what I told you why this Bible is not about communism, but communalism. It's by choice. Communism forces you to give everything you have. Communalism is a choice. The early Christians had a choice. He had a choice. He could have kept this land. He could have kept the money. Nobody would have cared. Nobody was forcing him to do it. Okay? So, going on. I'll answer later. So, after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. So when Ananias heard these words, he fell down, and he died. <laughs> That'll teach him. Great fear seized everyone who heard it. And the young men came and wrapped up his body. They carried it out, and they buried him. Harsh, man. Oh, it goes on. Oh. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter said to her, tell me. You know, I guess she thought her husband was not working. Don't know. Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land at such and such a price. So, what is he asking? He's saying, so, you sold it for $5,000. Yes, right. No, they sold it for $10,000. She lied to his face. Again, so this is something that she and her husband, Ananias and Sapphira, they both agreed to this deception for the purpose of of being made to look good, okay? They didn't do it out of love, all right? So Peter said to so Peter, she said, yes, that's what we did. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look at the feet of those who buried your husband. At, they're at the door. They'll carry you out as well. And immediately she fell down at his feet, and she died. Harsh, man. When the young men came in, they found her dead. They are like, dude, we don't want to go into this place. What the heck? They carried her body out and buried her beside her husband. Oh, they're together forever. Isn't that, isn't that romantic? And great fear seized the entire church and all who had heard these things. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so this is kind of an illustration of what happens to people who don't have love at their heart and are just doing this whole thing for status. So you know it's like the people who come to church that Jesus saw, the synagogue, the temple, and we're dumping big change coins into the uh, offering plate, dying, and everybody heard it and looked around and said, ooh, isn't he generous? They were giving out of the great amount that they already had, a little portion. But a woman came and gave everything she had. Who is the most generous? The woman who gave everything, right? Not the person who's dropping in the big coinage. So Jesus, and this, Bible, this scripture is also telling us to reconsider what true generosity means. So the early Christians gave because of Jesus Christ at the center of heart. They cared for the poor. They did it, number three, out of love for one another. And here's what happens in his illustration if you're just doing this for status. You have no place in the kingdom. If you don't want to share everything you have, don't share it. You want to share a portion? Share it. Remember, our giving, our life with one another should be motivated by love, not obligation. So this again demonstrates why those who want to use this passage to impose communism on everybody are absolutely wrong. It's a choice by love that we want to give to the poor and to the needy, not for the purpose of status symbol and not because we have to give. So I'm going to end with a story tonight. I actually had a member of our church years ago. Oh, my goodness. He saw the offering plate. You know, in our, our one service, we don't take an offering. Actually, we're not taking any offerings right now in terms of passing a plate. If people walk by the offering plate they want to give, they give. If they don't want to give, they don't give. We don't compel people to. If, if you feel like you're called to give, you give. But this guy saw the offering plate there, and he's standing and talking to me. He looks down, and he keeps looking down when we're talking, and he says, I should give some money in the offering plate. And I said, Why? He said, because I really should. And he opens up his wallet and he said, all I got is a $20 bill. He really didn't have a lot of money. I mean, he had some. So, but he had enough to take care of his bills and he had some left over. So he didn't really need this $20 bill, to be frank. But he looked at it and he says, I know I should give this $20 bill, but I, I, just, I, just, I just really don't want to. I said, why? He said, well, I've got things I'd like to do with this. I'd like to go out and... I'd like to go buy a scratch ticket. I'd like to go get something to eat with this. I can think of all these things I'd like to do with it. And he said, well, I know I should put in the offering plate. And I looked at him. I said, hey, look, man. You're not feeling it. You want to give it. Put it back in your pocket. Go enjoy the money. It's a gift of God. He said, really? I said, go enjoy it. He said, but I should give. I said, you should only give because out of generosity, because it's out of love. It should never be forced, because that 20 bucks, throw it to the offering plate is not going to do you any good. It doesn't earn you anything. It's got to be a gift of love. See, being forced to give doesn't earn you any credit. Giving out of obligation doesn't earn you anything. We give out of love. That doesn't earn us anything either. It doesn't get you a, a special place in the kingdom of heaven. You give out a love because you understand oh, Jesus Christ is at the center of your heart and you've been loved very deeply. Let's pray. Whew. Thank you, God, for this lesson today. Uh, I needed it. It's a reminder of why we're here on this earth, to love one another, as we have been loved. So God, help us Christians to do a better job of loving by caring for the poor and the needy, by giving generously of what you've given us, being a source of blessing to this world. Not because we have to. We're not compelled to. But out of the love that you've had for us, we are transformed and touched 
by your Holy Spirit. We love one another. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope this is a good lesson for you today. May the Lord bless you and keep you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Have a beautiful week. Give generously out of love. Amen.